we all get stuck into rigid patterns of what we should do. You know, we should all have guns and store grains. We should all have gardens. No, it's bigger than that. The, the thing is, we all underestimate what's going to happen. These are big changes. And I think in order to survive, you've got to figure out your niche, what you're good at, what you feel strongly about, and become good at that. Because we're going to need all sorts of skills. This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption, with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. Early on when I learned about peak oil, I turned to a website called Energy Bulletin. It was, it, it, it had the kinds of information but opinions as well about what's really happening and how can we respond. It was about a year later that I started to correspond with the editor, Bart Anderson. So I am very pleased to introduce somebody who I gotta believe you've gotta be as immersed in all the information about energy as anybody on the planet? I think so, except for people who've been in it longer, like Colin Campbell and so forth. You, uh, tell, tell me what it's like. I mean, that's been five years, four years, five years that you've been editing, you know, a site that's grown a lot, I gotta believe. Right, and you know, the, the, um, there's a graph of the readership and as peak oil has picked up steam, you know, so is the readership like I that. I believe that. So, if somebody is new to peak oil, can you give them a clue of what, what's the thing we're talking about? Okay, well, the good news is it's starting to get into the mainstream newspapers. Yeah. Um, and they have some fairly good explanations, but basically is there's only so much oil in the earth, and even though we will find more, at a certain point, uh, we're going to reach the maximum production um, so many million, billion barrels per day, per year, whatever. And after that, they will, the production will get mm. less and less, mm -hmm. and oil will get more and more expensive. Expensive. Now, we saw that last year. I mean, last Correct. year it, it was, what, three times what it is now. Mm -hmm. But now the prices are down, so do we not have to worry about it? Or is that just a little short-term blip? What's going on? Okay. Well, that's one of the reasons it's, it's a difficult concept. Because it's commodity, oil is a commodity, and like all commodities, it has sort of booms and busts. Yeah. So, but if you stand back a little bit, you know there will be a curve like this that'll follow the supplies more or less, and there will be ups and downs. But the overall shape will be going up to a peak, and the prices will continue on up. So, why um, should I mean? Part of the prevailing view is well. They're working on renewables, they're working on other things, you know, we can't we substitute? Yes, you can substitute to some extent. The problem is oil is magic. Oil has such an oil, uh, such an energy return on energy invested. It's so efficient um, that there's almost nothing that comes close to it. Mm. Uh, so renewables are great, but in order to replace uh, what we get from oil, we, we would have to multiply our renewables many fold and it's going to be very difficult. And there's also, it's, you know, it's portable. Not only is it oh. energy dense, but you, you can carry it in an airplane. That's right. right. You, can use it for, you can use it for fuel, to make electricity. It's, it's amazing stuff. How do you think this shift, which I, I think some people believe we may have reached that point and are start, peak, just starting right. on the, down the decline, um, even if it's a couple of years off, mm -hmm. how, what, what effects are we going to see coming down into our lives? Well, the, the good news is that we had a taste of that last year when oil prices went up and, you know, suddenly people began using mass transit, uh, um, food prices started going up, a lot of things started happening. Well, in a way, it's fortunate that we got that taste of it, but when peak oil really kicks in, it will, that's just a foretaste of what's going to come. Say more. So, that, could be, that could be scary, Yeah, right? It, I mean, it, it could be scary. That you know, the, the transportation is going to cost more um, because oil is an integral part in the manufacture of almost everything. Yeah. The prices of almost everything will go up. Um, energy in general will probably go up because if you can't get energy from oil, you'll have to substitute from something else, and the cost of those things will go up. Um, folks that watch Peak Moment are sort of 
I think by and large aren't the survivalists who feel like they need to, you know, grab their shotgun and their mm -hmm. whatever and go out to the woods, but how living as we've been living, what kind of changes do you picture we're going to need to be making or how can we make that transition easier for ourselves? Okay, you talked when we were talking beforehand about we could do this in six hours and that's a question that would take us <laughs> five of those six hours. Okay, let's no, do the little, yes, I bet. Yeah, but, but yeah, I mean the basic message is a lot is going to change a lot mm. and probably the most important thing people can do now is start finding out about it. The thing that really worries me is not so much the actual shortages because actually we are pretty fat and rich and happy right now but the problem is just the shock of running into limits and people getting panicked that's a real mm. danger and the way we can avoid that is by learning about it first so that's I think one of the the key items that I'd suggest to people is Learning about it. Learning about peak oil itself. And, and all the implication that that brings up. For example, uh, Richard Heinberg's just written a book on peak coal, okay? The same phenomenon we're seeing in oil will almost certainly happen in coal a little later. So there is another allied subject. We need to know about those things. We're running to a lot of peaks, aren't yep. we? I mean, I mean, specialized minerals and metals and other things. I mean, it seems like the planet sort of Exactly. So we're bouncing right. against some, some limits. The, the, the limits to growth, limits of mm -hmm. growth mm -hmm. that Donella Mallet Meadows and her team wrote in the, in the 70s. It's all coming to pass. So part of what I hear is the need to sort of shift our way of thinking exactly. about how we live. Exactly. And so if you had that six hours, but you don't, and what, would you, what, kind, of, what kind of mind shifts would you be encouraging people to make? There's so many. I, I think the first thing is just to prepare oneself. What, what's the name? Psychologically, of it? psychologically, sort of, uh -huh. a lot of changes coming. You know, hold on. You know, we can deal with it, but just be prepared. What's the name of that song? Everything you know is wrong. I'm afraid there's a lot of truth really? to that. Yeah, most of these assumptions, especially over the last 30 years, are going to be overturned. Well, so we've assumed prepared. that we keep growing forever yep. and always have a better life than yep. the people ahead of be, before us. Yep. And, and be wealthier. Well, certainly the economic downturn has, has you know, said that may not be so. Correct. Um, and America's at the top of the heap. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of, Absolutely. Of, of assumptions. So if, what would the wise person, in, okay, knowing this, is, knowing this is before us, the wise person then says, okay, what next? I'm getting, I'm familiar with, we're gonna get some, we're gonna be living with limits, mm -hmm. all kinds of limits. Um, how do how do I um, how do my household how does my household sort of do we start practicing that okay, now? Okay, the what quick answer is look to see what your great grandparents did. Oh. Okay, that would be a really good start. You know, th they were acutely aware of limits. You know, they turned off lights. You know, if they had okay, electric yeah. lights or gas lights, uh, they reused things. I mean, th I mean, probably the best. I think the most. It useful and also fun ways to go back and see what people before us did. They weren't dumb, okay? Yeah. We can learn yeah. from them. And yeah. it, it's, it, it's, it's fun and it's a very deepening experience. You know, what I hear from you is this could be, this, this, this isn't just doom and gloom. No. And, and I think there are some people who feel like peak oil hits and suddenly we, we, we have to have, we have to work to survive. So there's mm -hmm. a whole survivalist thread right. in this. And I don't hear that from you. No, and I, I think that's historically inaccurate. I mean, look through history. I, I, has that ever happened? There are some short-term emergencies that are pretty hard to weather. But by and large, these kind of changes, you know, they're going to take years and decades. And a really good, good thing to do is some recent examples. Look at some the examples of Cuba and North Korea. Both of them had to face... Uh, oil supplies that were much less and mm. much more expensive after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, if you look at what the North Koreans did, I think everybody would say dysfunctional. You don't want to do what they did. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, Cuba, whatever you think of the political system, did some amazing things and fairly quickly. But they didn't have to do it like in two weeks. You know, it's a matter of years. So, so what we folks that are already getting into permaculture or organic farming in the backyard or bees in the city or whatever yeah. are sort of greasing the skids Absolutely. maybe for all the rest of us. They're the heroes. They're the pioneers. Uh, you know, one of the ironic things is we all want to start gardens. And I started a garden. 
But it's a lot of work and it takes skills and I admire the people that do. You know, but there are other things that we can do that can be just as effective. And one is like look around, start reusing things, not spend so much money. Um, for example, we live in a condominium and, and during most of the year um, we spend $25 a month on electricity. So it's possible really to shrink what we need in order to lead a meaningful life. Now one could say, one could say um, that fits because, you know, we gray hairs don't need as much. We're not raising mm -hmm. our families and so on. But we can also point back to, you said, to our grandparents, and I'll go back to my childhood in the 50s, mm -hmm. or my grandparents exactly. lived in smaller houses, yes. had less stuff, but we had more family together mm -hmm. time. Yeah. And so what I hear in there is the possibility for more quality, perhaps, Absolutely. in our lives. If we're not stressed out dealing with You know, with one of the problems with this great wealth that we've had over the last 30, 40, 50 years is that it's great, but we're fatter now, we're more alienated. Mm. There's a lot of dysfunction that's going on. Um, so th there are bad parts about what's, uh, what's going to come, and there are good parts. And I think what you described about some of the, the community and family feeling is one of the good parts. Since you've been watching the peak oil movement and, and energy and so on for such a long time, mm -hmm. Have you got any guidance for folks who are getting acquainted with that about what's reliable way to look at this, you know, in this movement? Um, well, for, well for, first of all, read several people. You know, don't uh, just rely on one person or one source. Um, I like Richard Heinberg and I like David Holmgren, the permaculturalist mm -hmm. from Australia. Okay. Those are my men. But there are many, many other people out there. And they all have pieces of the truth. So um, look around at the different people. And the other thing is I'd suggest, um, you know, they're the analytical, technical guys. They have a certain piece of the truth. But one of the things I really feel strongly about is women writers. They bring an entirely different view about what's going to come and how to deal with it that I think brings a real whiff of sanity because the technical stuff can get pretty dry and pretty... Uh, inhuman. The women writers who are they talking about, well the women writers that I read like yeah. Sharon Astick yes. or even Carolyn Baker are yes. looking at real people, what's happening you know with ourselves in our psyches mm -hmm. um, and and how we deal with our families and how we yep. raise our children and what I see is a lot of promise mm -hmm. in this but I'm, I'm with you, it's like, in, I'm not a gardener. I mean, yeah. these thumbs are not green, yeah. but there are other things I can do. Absolutely. I can teach somebody how to can yes. or, you know. Yeah. I, I think, and that's things. the other thing. We all get stuck into rigid patterns of what we should do. You know, we should all have guns and stored grains. We should all have gardens. No, it's bigger than that. The, the thing is, we all underestimate what's going to happen. These are big changes. And I think in order to survive, you've got to figure out your niche, what you're good at, what you feel strongly about and become good at that because we're going to need all sorts of skills. But you know, that's advice that's true at any time in, one, any time in a society. Yeah, yeah. But mean, especially true best. now. Especially true now because, uh, I mean, for, for the last 20, 30 years, you know, if you wanted to be successful in the society, there pretty much was one path mm. to do it. Mm. And that's not going to be true anymore. If you were setting up a curriculum for oh, a 20-something, yeah. what, what, what would you advise or what would you have them be learning? Well, uh, academic schools aren't necessarily the best places that's, that's to get this. That's part of why I'm asking. Um, and neither the corporate path has a lot of dysfunction built into it. Mm. Um, you know, living poor for a while and learning how to do it well, that's a valuable skill, I, I think. Um, you know, being able to learn things on your own, not being dependent on big institutions, um, very important. Some of those institutions are going to, I mean, are becoming very dysfunctional themselves exactly. and are going to, I mean, exactly. we cannot, I mean, we we're starting to talk, we cannot yeah. count the government right. doing anything particularly helpful here. Mm -hmm. We've certainly not seen anything promising in terms of rail transportation or infrastructure or a lot of other things. Okay. Here I'd like to disagree with you slightly. Oh, good. Our, um, one of the big ecologists in the 60s and 70s was E.P. Odom, who's a brother of Howard Odom, the great energy ecologist. Anyway, he said, small is beautiful, like the book that uh, we both read in the 70s said, but big is powerful. Mm. You know, you, mm. There's a tendency for us to like think about gardens and our small local communities, and that's excellent, that's wonderful, but 
if there's a war, a lot of the bets are off. Or the other, what's going on right now, a huge percentage of our gross national product goes to military preparation. Um, those are big issues. They make a big difference in how well we'll be able to adapt. So we can't forget about those. I, 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 I can get that because it's that overlay permeates the culture. Yeah. The question we may have is how much can we count on from that? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and what kind of curves are we going to be thrown? Mm -hmm. How many other wars will we, you know, the U.S. be involved in? And including resource wars. Well, you know, you asked uh, what are some of the traits, and one of them is not to look for simple answers. No. This, this is a, what's coming up is going to be complicated. So, um, yes, we're, gonna, we're going to have trouble with the large national governments, but we also need them, because there are some things the large national government can do that you can't do on a local level. So, um, it's like the blind man and the elephant. Like all, there's a lot of truths out there. So let's not just get stuck on like one particular view of things. You know, the only way most of us can imagine a future is based on the past. Mm -hmm. And here we are living in a materially abundant and information full. I mean, the internet has totally changed the landscape exactly. of the planet in, or much of the planet in a very, very short period of time. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I find challenging is trying to picture, you know, will we continue to have things like the internet a a along, you know, in the next 20 years? Okay, one of the unsung fathers of peak oil was H.T. Odom, the energy ecologist, who before he died wrote uh, a book with his wife about um, the way down. I don't remember the exact mm -hmm. title. But in that, he said, you know, we. If we have to sacrifice in order to keep the internet up, let's do it. To keep communication going, it is that important. It's, it's critical. For example, if you're trying to grow a grain and there is a, a disease cropping up, you know, how important is it to, find, to be able to diagnose and fix that? You know, like 50 years ago, if you were in the middle of Africa, it'd be very difficult. Now it's easy. Actually, it strikes me that that internet is part of what can empower us for the lo more local yes, responses. Absolutely. Because if people are using it for medical information and taking more responsibility for exactly. their, their, their health, whatever. And it strikes me that the internet, full of noise as it is and full of all kinds of other stuff, you can still sniff out really valuable stuff right now absolutely when you need it so I you yeah. know it, I, I kind of find myself picturing okay more of us will live say off-grid and with our gardens and and learn to sew again and fix our bicycles but with your internet but connection. with my internet connection absolutely what was it there's a there's a great book was it in the 70s 80s called the techno peasant and I think that summarizes techno peasant you know, interesting what, what's going to be coming interesting notion so all that stuff that you've been swimming in, 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 the, in the energy world, what haven't we talked about? What kinds of okay. things? Well, one thing I'd really like to get across is that, you know, most of the discussion about peak oil has been by white, professional, middle-aged um, guys like me. And <laughs> it's been wonderful to have more women involved, but you know what? We need much more diversity than that. We need different colored faces. We need different nationalities. Some of the best thinkers, and for my money about peak oil, are people from a multicultural background. For example, Dmitry Orlov, who's Russian, Ukrainian, American, all sorts of things. Or Amanda Kovatana. I don't know. She's new to me. Tell me. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about her. Well, she just lives up the hill there, and she's uh, an English mother, Thai father, raised here in America. And so she brings all of these things mm. together. And, you know, there's, America's a great culture. But we've got our blind spots, our narrownesses, and we need those other viewpoints. I would think that we also, I found myself wondering, how much is peak oil entering the conversation, not just in, the English, not just in Europe and Australia and the U.S., but, but Central Asia and Main Asia? And, I mean, is it starting, do you have any sense of that? Well, you would, I would hope. You know, that's one of the things I've up? really been curious about, like how much awareness is there in China, India, and Russia? And it's been very hard for me to get information. Mm -hmm. I read several foreign languages, but I can't read Chinese. So um, th that's critical, you know, because China's such a big player. Because, I mean, they are the, this is their century. Yeah. What we've, and, and so what they do and don't do relative to energy and materials and so on is going to affect 
all, right. already is you affecting know, all of us. I think China's a great example because if you think about it, in the last century, they moved from being an empire to uh, being uh, a weak uh, republic to fighting the Japanese to being an ultra-left communist country to being, you know, a virtually capitalist country. Look at all the changes they went through. Okay, they're going to make changes coming up. But we can just, pr we hope, we pray that they'll help us make the right changes. Yes. And if they don't know about peak oil, we're in trouble. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. Though, from what I've heard, Representative Bartlett says he's talked to the chi some of the Chinese elite, and he thinks that they are aware of peak oil, and they're smart people. So I would hope so. But even so, it's difficult because they'll have to get that message across to the masses. And, and since, uh, coming back to the United States, yeah. since that's really, as you said, starting to get into the mainstream, it's yeah. certainly... It, I, I don't. Is it coming through our government at all yet in terms of what kind of policies? Not much, not much. I mean, you know, for the past since I've been in it, really, it's all it's call, all come from the grassroots, from volunteer organizations, from vol you know people working at it in crazy ways like you and like me, and um, it's, it's gra now it's being cut, picked up by the media. And it's, it's amazing, you know, now we have millions of hits on Google for peak oil. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But we still, the, the government still is not involved I in mean, that. it's yeah. Except I, the one part of the government I expect is very aware of it is the military. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they're way ahead of everybody else in renewables and understanding this. You know, regularly we get, um, you know, they're peak oil aware. You know, people in military colleges are writing about it, looking at the implications. Yeah, they're way ahead. So we kind of need to keep an eye on whatever they're keeping an eye on. Oh, yeah. Because what they're, they're going to be affecting the, the government policies. You know, and, and one of the other things is, you know, we all come from different backgrounds. Like some of us are, you know, hippie counterculture people from the 60s. Other people come from the military. Other people are very much in industry. Uh, some rock-ribbed Republicans. And it's, it's fascinating. This is one subject that we all can work together on. You know, we're going to have our disagreements. But, you know, I find that I've got much more in common with a, like a rock-ribbed libertarian, you know, from the Midwest who understands peak oil, much more in common with him than some of my fellow liberals here on the peninsula who don't understand it. That's interesting. It's a kind of a leveling, isn't it? Yeah. Because we all are going to be affected. I mean, that's sort of the message is like, your life will not be the same in the next, right. you tell me. 20, certainly 20 years, 10 years. Oh, 10, How, when, I, I'd say five years. Five years. We're going to see a d different, different conversation, different landscape. Absolutely. Yeah. And the thing is, when look at the Soviet Union. Nobody expected the wall to come down and so forth. It happened. Everybody was shocked. And that's what's going to happen with us. So we should be prepared for that. Be, you know, we th right now people think things will never change. The government will never wake up. People are always going to be consumers. No. This could come very quickly mm -hmm. and with a d degree of intensity that we can't dream of. So <laughs> fasten your seatbelts. Fasten your seatbelts and um, um, know where your nearby gardeners yeah. are. and Make lots of local friends and, and uh, don't spend a lot of money. You know. Yeah, yeah, I would say that. It's like so that you have some resilience built exactly. into your life here so that it, if something unexpected what kinds of things do you think we might see the, in the unexpected? Can we picture, I mean, can, we, can you really picture the truck stop coming to the supermarket? Not for long. I mean, those are, those are the kinds of questions that people wonder. Well, look what happened in wartime when supplies of oil to some countries were basically cut off. You know, private transportation basically came to a halt. Okay. I have a friend who was in Sweden during that time. Just, nobody had private cars. People got by somehow. And I don't know if that'll happen, but it could happen. Mm -hmm. that, but that's the sort of changes we should be ready for. And, you know, if you read history, it's not that big a deal. You know, it is something, but people live through it, and people have meaningful lives, and we'll have, you know, we'll be around 15, 20, 100 years from now, and things will be very different. But, um, you know, we'll do it. Well, that's, I mean, that's the part that's heartening to me, is that people say that... The, the big capability that humans have is we are adaptable. Oh. No, another good preparation is to be a poor graduate student. You know, like, I was a poor graduate student for about 15 years. And it's excellent preparation. You, you learn to have a wonderful, fulfilling life, you know, on a fraction of the income that the normal corporate uh, person has. 
That I like that. That's yeah. So maybe that's a techno peasant. There, there you go. The 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 perpetual. perpetual yeah, <laughs> graduate student. Graduate student, living on a on a small budget, mm -hmm. but a rich life. Oh yeah. I mean. Yeah. Campus. You know, people say that. A number of people say that you know the life around campus is, is wonderful. It's small, walkable. Yeah. You know, you've got a great community. Yeah. It doesn't sound so bad to me. I I think it sounds great. Thank you for giving My us pleasure. some 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 upbeat. Um, mm -hmm. perspectives and yet the need to be prepared. I really, it's been fun. Me too. Thank you for joining me. Okay. You're watching Peak Moment. Conversations about a changing energy future, which I think is a changing current time. I'm with Bart Anderson of Energy Bulletin. Join us next time. My mind goes back to uh, when Julian Darley of Post Carbon and I were sitting at the cafe about a block away. And we were talking about this and we took out a napkin and wrote down about nine points that I think for me, like frame my concerns and I think give a way of thinking about peak oil and the problem that's really helpful. The first is energy decline is inevitable. We've got to get used to that idea, just accept it. Second, big energy is not the way out. You know, some of those things might be helpful, but there's no magic bullet, and especially not big energy, which always has big drawbacks. Third, one of the key things that we all can do is to reduce consumption and reduce population. Many ways to do that. Fourth, don't try to think too big. Start from where you are. You know, we all can do something. And if you start doing something, then um, you feel empowered. You feel better. You don't, you don't, you don't get depressed. Fifth, produce things locally. Um, this is a theme that goes through uh, the thoughts of many, many thinkers on peak oil, relocalization. Six, relish the power of symbolic seeds. Okay, it's not all generators, it's not all efficiency. There are some things that are very powerful to do. People will say they're just symbolic, but some of the most important things in human history are symbolic, can't forget that. Seven, honor public service. Eight, um, anyone is welcome. This is to be a non-sectarian movement, not promoting any political party, any nationality, any ethnic group. Everybody's, everybody can come in. And ninth, hope and reason. You know, it's really possible to get into rants, to dwell on fears and so forth, but that's a dead end. So I'd go back to hope and reason. And I think that's my nine points.